So what's your best advice for an aspiring student documentary filmmaker? My best advice for aspiring filmmakers is to do it because you love it. It's not something you should go into just because you think it'd be a, a good job. I mean, I often say, and I've heard this about other creative professions, is you should do it because you can't do anything else. I mean, if you want to make money and have a good career, there's a lot easier, I'm not going to say better, but a lot easier ways to make money than being a, a filmmaker, especially an independent documentary filmmaker. But if you love it and you wake up every day excited to do it, which I certainly do most days, most days I wake up excited to do it, I think it's, 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 a, great, it's a great field. And so I think go, in, go, go into it because you have to, because you love it and you really can't see yourself doing something else. Is there a program of study that you would recommend for a college student? Uh, for a college student, I mean, I think get a general education, you know, a good liberal arts education. I mean, understand how to tell a story, how to communicate to people. And, and so I really, I think it's, it's this, this idea of, of telling stories, communicating to other human beings. That medium's going to keep shifting. And, and we know right now it's, it's film, television, but it's quickly becoming internet distribution and, and uh, all these other mediums that are going to develop out of this digital revolution. How do you approach research for a documentary film about a historical subject? Research in a documentary film, it varies. It really depends on the film and what you're doing. I mean, I've done a, a variety of different films, and sometimes you're working with an expert that really knows the subject, so you as a filmmaker are more focused on, on sort of the, the craft of the filmmaking and the technology and, and the fundraising or what have you. In other cases, I'm writing the script and really doing all the work where I need to do the research. Uh, with the Gettysburg story, I had the benefit of having grown up in Gettysburg with a dad who's a historian who knew a lot about it. So I'd been around it. So organically, I had taken in a lot of Gettysburg history, whether I wanted to or not. I learned a lot. One thing I learned was how surprisingly interested I was in it, and it was really kind of fun. Uh, and two, that it, it's such a rich subject. And really, with, with Gettysburg, I would say the challenge isn't so much doing the research, it's eliminating. There's, it's just so infinite. There's so much. There's so many books about it that, um, especially to do a, what was a 56-minute film for public television broadcast. The challenge isn't getting enough information and research. It's really filtering that all through into a coherent, dramatic, emotionally compelling narrative. And that was a real challenge. How is writing a script for a documentary film different than writing a book or an article or some larger a traditional text project. Writing a script for a film often comes out of a book or a paper or a, a larger resource, if you will, that has more words in it. And so, again, that kind of goes back to you're your editing it, literally, and that's kind of the art of cinema, if you will. Um, and so you start with sort of this big pile of possibility, and then you really need to get it into a structure. Now, something I certainly try to do in my films is tell a story, and so then you get into a lot of dramatic storytelling and stuff that goes back to, you know, Aristotle, ancient Greeks. You know, looking at how do you tell a story effectively, and how do you how do you engage someone emotionally? But also with a documentary, you're, you're using real facts, you're using good history, and so that's always part of it. And certainly with a Gettysburg story film, we're having really good historians looking at it to make sure when we're you know, you're, you're trying to get the right words, you're trying to make it exciting, but also you can't be wrong. And so that's often a delicate balance. And sometimes historians and, you know, err on the scientific side of trying to qualify something and say, well, it wasn't the greatest battle of all time, because if you look at the number of statistics and blah, 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 but you could say that within a certain realm, of, and, and, you know, that defeats the drama, but you can't say, and never has humankind seen something as big and explosive as this. So there's a balance there to try to tell a story, but also be factually correct in a documentary. Let's talk about interviewing. Uh, what have you learned about conducting a good interview during the course of your career in filmmaking? When it comes to interviewing, I mean, there's a lot of ways to go about it. There's often pre-interviews where you get to know the person a little bit. Um, and usually, I think what's really important when you're doing a documentary and it's an interview that's going to be on screen is you need to capture it on screen. And sometimes you, you want the emotional and, and the facial expressions and, and, and all these things outside of just the words spoken are as, if not more important than what's said. And so you have to be aware of that. And you want to catch that on camera. If you don't get that, you know, in the can, so to speak, you know, onto your, onto your disc, onto your tape, whatever you're recording onto, it's worthless to you, really. You can't say in a film, you can't write what that expression was. You need to capture that. So you have to be ready, first of all. And, uh, you know, in a sit-down interview, that's more controlled. But sometimes if you're, you know, on a, on a run-and-gun documentary, I've done a lot of shoots where you're, you know, films that are done cinema verite style running around. And so you have to be ready. I also think when you're interviewing a subject, you have to be fundamentally interested in the subject. 
Um, sometimes also a subject may not be comfortable. You know, if it's an actor or someone familiar with cameras, they love it and they're ready for the camera. Sometimes, I mean, I've had professors that they just don't like the camera, they don't want to be on it, and so you have to warm them up. And so usually the first two or three questions of an interview, of especially someone not comfortable being on camera, are wasted. So you don't, you don't say, so tell me, why did your mother murder your father? You don't ask that in the first question. You know, you, you say, hey, what, the weather's pretty bad today. What do you think about that? Or, or, you know, you start with sort of a softball question, one, two, or three. And then when you start to feel comfort level when they're really responding to you, um, that will allow you to kind of get into it. Sort of a simple trick that's, that's very obvious once you think about it, but especially a beginning, maybe a student filmmaker may not be aware of, is when you're doing an on-camera interview, and especially if you're interviewing the person and you're not on camera, do not say much when the other person, or really say nothing when the other person is talking. It's very common in conversation, a normal conversation, to say, uh-huh, yeah, right, oh yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But you do that on an interview, you're ruining your clips because you're talking over the person. And so you really have to learn how to respond, engage with the person, respond emotionally to what they're saying to you, but don't verbalize it. And so it's, you know, not, nodding your head, being like, smile, laugh, look disgusted, what have you. But don't say anything because that'll be very, your editor will hate you. And if you're editing it, you'll hate yourself. Do you think digital tools will revolutionize the filmmaking industry or, or have they done so already? Sure. I mean, digital tools have, have transformed a lot of industries, especially media industries. I think it started with publishing and home publishing in the 80s. And it certainly has reached cinema, television, films, whatever you want to call it, uh, the screen. And I'm certainly a product of that. I've almost never shot with traditional film. We're all working in the digital world, so it's absolutely transformed it. Fundamentally, it's made it a lot cheaper now, like anything else digital in the computer world. And so cameras and quality that were un unavailable to, on a budget of most documentary filmmakers, you know, now exist in the, in the pocket of, you know, in a cell phone, basically, you know, an iPhone or an Android phone, like the image quality of that is spectacular. And you're, you, have, you have a better studio in your pocket than Ken Burns did when he made his first film. So that's a pretty spectacular change. And so I think it's very exciting. I mean, for me, a lot of work I did with Gettysburg, with the Gettysburg story, it wouldn't have been creatively possible. Not, it just was impossible, and not even talking cost being a factor here. Uh, the time-lapse work, the drone camera, like using an aerial drone, having a, a high-definition camera that's this big with image quality approaching 35 millimeter attached to it, flying around. It's, it's, it's like something out of the Jetsons, practically, and yet it's possible and we're doing it, and it's, it's developing new ways of storytelling. And, and, and to me, that's really exciting, is you're getting these images that were, what can you imagine? Can you make that an image? And there's all these sort of young kids hacking cameras and software and whatever else to try to get really cool images. And it's, that's how the whole motion control time-lapse world came about. And, and uh, it's really exciting. And I, I often say this is like the Gettysburg story film, we really shot it in 2012. If we shot it today, we'd use technology that didn't exist in 2012. And I can't imagine if we shot it in five years from now, what we would shoot with. And so it's really exciting. But to me, that all sort of comes back to that fundamental quality of a good story, creative storytelling, doing that in a good way with your tools. They're all tools to tell a story.